basic joints and things like that, but nothing really as extensive as what I had um, experienced while working with uh, CLI and Python. Um, and so what that means is for uh, a lot of my work, I found myself, um, I would have to use the raw SQL and parameter binding feature in Diesel. Um, so uh, I started asking myself, well, if I'm going to be using raw SQL and parameter binding for the bulk of my work, why am I using, why would I install Diesel, learn how to use it, and then you know, barely make use of it? So uh, I started exploring other options. And I also started asking myself, why was I, why had I gone through all of these um, exercises of using a card builder in the first place? And, um, I think that, you know, it was a lesson learned, um, is all I can say, and going forward, I'm just, I plan, at least in my work, not to be using an RM, a card builder anymore, instead of relying on raw C1. And so, um, essentially, what, what this is, in case anybody here hasn't done it before, is you're writing SQL and then you're wrapping it in ROS and, uh, and executing in a safe way to avoid SQL injection. Um, if you're going to use Postgres, uh, you're going to use a, a program, a library called Bus Postgres, and you're going to use SQLite. Uh, there's a library that is basically designed exactly with the same sort of API as Rust Postgres called RustQL. Um, both of these libraries are very easy to use. Uh, there's, you can get started using it and have an application written and probably an app, uh, or less. Uh, and another feature that I really like is that it's relatively easy to extend once you know what the parts are in Rust. You, know, it, you just code to all interfaces or traits in Rust. Uh, there's a two SQL trait and from a SQL trait now that allows you to map between a relational uh, column, uh, table column type with a type in Rust. So Rust Postgres, it, uh, it, as far as I'm concerned, it, 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 feature, it has all the features that I wanted um, and that I needed, so I'm satisfied using it so far. Um, again, uh, it, uh, off the shelf, it, it supports all of the standard data types, column types that one would need, and through uh, feature gating, uh, allows you to expand the coverage of different uh, more exotic types, uh, less used types. And um, I've personally written like a support for an interval, a time interval. Um, it was a relatively straightforward exercise because I had access to existing code available on GitHub that I could reference and I figured things out. So um, but, you know, if I can do it, I would thank anybody. Um, uh, <coughs> the features for both operations, you use prepared statements and um, this connection point and right, if you're going to use async IO, uh, there's, uh, there's a library for doing that. So here it is in a nutshell. This is available on the read and follow your list of objects on GitHub. But basically, you know, it's straightforward to create at the very top if you can't see, we're just creating connections. It's an example of how to create a connection. Um, the second example is the same. Uh, if anyone has written uh raw SQL with parameter by another language, this is just raw SQL relatively familiar. Um, and this is just to kind of give you a feel for what the library features, but um, I'm not expecting you to um, have to specifically read them. But the idea is to just present you have a query string, um, and you, what we're doing is we're binding a slice of parameters to that query string, um, and we're doing that through uh, calling either uh, calling one of two methods on a connection, either query or uh, execute. Uh, and there are differences. Execute will tell you how many records are updated, whereas query will return uh, a collection for you to iterate over and to transform to us. And then at the very bottom is just an example of how easy it is to create a prepared statement. Uh, there's really not that much to it. Um, I really do think that if you have any programming experience, prior programming experience, you should be able to create this up relatively quickly. Um, so, for this talk, I realized that um, I 
half hour is time enough to cover all the concepts that I would like to discuss with everyone. Uh, so um, I thought, well, what can I do to really add more to this experience? And I decided, why don't I create a program that covers most of the, that encompasses most of the concepts that I want to discuss. And then I'll just touch on some of them tonight, but I'll just release it to GitHub. And if anyone can go and read it, you know, at their leisure. And so I have. Uh, so I'll share a link to that at, at, at the end. And that link is also provided on the GitHub website if you want to go check it out. But, uh, so for the remainder of the talk, what I'm going to do is just highlight a few of those features. Um, and uh, this project, what I had chosen was something that was Again, it's going to encompass all the concepts and shows and highlight some of the cool things that I thought were underutilized, at least in Postgres. Um, so, specifically in this example, I, you know, I'm working with a TSTC range column type. Um, and I thought TSTC range is pretty cool because it's a, it's a date time, it's a range type uh, between uh, two date times that have uh, time zones as well. Um, and another feature that programmers, or another Pattern that programmers use uh, for working with uh, 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 when a programmer has to include a collection as a program uh, as a parameter in a query. Um, there are different uh, approaches to doing that, and I've, I've tried all of them. Someone had told me a really cool way, a much cleaner way to uh, import a collection of data into a query using Lemmas. And so uh, I'm showing people how to do that in this, in this example. Um, and all of this again is available on GitHub, which you can check out there. So uh, the way this program basically works is we, you know, it's got two key features. We want to be able to schedule a conference room. And uh, we want to be able to check whether a conference room is. Uh, sorry, so this, this, this project is for scheduling conference rooms. That's, this, is, this is the scenario that I decided to pick. Right? So, um, so the, I want to create two basic features that I want to, that I want to, uh, that I want to cover here. Um, that is being able to schedule a conference room and uh, check whether the conference room is available. Um, or check whether the costs are available for first set of time slots. So just to have just to cover those two features, uh, there's actually a lot of work involved, as many of you can probably imagine. Um, I'm not going to touch on all of them today, but I'll just touch on a few of them so you kind of get an idea of uh, what to expect if you're going to go through the project on your own. So we're going to have to create a relational data model. Uh, Functions that are going to persist in the models of the database. Um, there's, going to, there's error handling, there's logging, uh, I'm creating a connection pool, and there's integration tests. It's, it's essentially the entire back end for uh, a robust program. Um, and there's one that basically shows the patterns that I'm using in my work today. So I, I hope you find them useful. Uh, essentially, our data modeling is this kind of program. We've got four types of models that we're talking about. Um, um, we've got buildings, rooms, users, and meetings. Um, and as you see here, it's pretty simple. Buildings have conference rooms. User, a user can schedule a room for the meeting. A room cannot be scheduled for more than one meeting per time slot. All right, so presented here at the top, is uh, the SQL representation of our user set. It's pretty straightforward. It's got identifiers, internal identifier, and external identifier, um, and a bunch of names. So it's, it's, a, it's a very simple example. Uh, now, what, what I want to show is how this how this maps to bus types. Uh, down below, this is what your user model may look uh, would look like if you were to use bus. And as you can see here, the, at the bottom, um, so it's like big serials or big ends, essentially maps to I64s, a UUID maps to a UUID type in, post, in, in 
Awesome. And uh, bar, bar parts, mats, and strings. Uh, <coughs> we're deriving just a couple features for user to facilitate other other types of uh, operations. Uh, so we have our user model having to ask the database. Um, this is the only example um, that I'm going to go through here. Um, but it's very similar for adding any of the other models uh, to the database. Uh, so what you see here, you should be able to, as long as you understand this, you should be able to go through the rest of models.rx file on, on GitHub and uh, understand what's going on. So it's fairly, I mean, it's not that large, but you know, it's a fairly long block of code that I've just broken into three separate slots, and I'll just discuss in each piece. Um, <clears throat> So a uh, function signature is just like it takes a few string parameters by name for usage. And I'm um, passing in the logger and the transaction. And this function returns a result that is either a user or a custom error that uh, error type that I need from them. Now usually uh, with uh, database development in Rust, um, the very first thing you want to do is take the type and then convert it to the type that's compatible with Plus Postgres. Um, in other words, uh, that type has to implement the two SQL traits, as I had uh, mentioned earlier. Um, string types are by default faults supported uh, off, the, off the shelf within the Rust Postgres. I didn't need to transform them anymore. Uh, so there's no transformation required for this example. Uh, so after I would usually transform that to step, I would declare the SQL, which I've done here. I, Assigned it to, it's, it, this is a string slice. Right, so we've got our, our entire query represented as a string. Uh, imagine all of this and then this right below. Okay, it's all part of the same function. So what we've done is declare the query as a string. Now, what we're doing is we're calling, we're executing, using the transaction parameter I was passed. We're saying a hey, transaction, one query, using the query string, the query string above, um, and using the following uh, slice of parameters. First name, last name, and user name. Um, when you're executing the query method, uh, what it returns is a result. It is a result. Uh, I immediately want to evaluate what type of error it was, um, and in this case, I just I don't even, I just want to I just want to use my own error type. I don't want to propagate the error type that was passed by the bus but I want to propagate my own error. Type. And I, I, in this case, um, I, I lock. I, I permit. I do not provide some error lock. I found that error locking has helped me a lot. Um, uh, this is like very low level. It tells me the source of, of the problem, especially when I'm running this in a larger application. Um, this is very useful. So this is this is how I'm uh, And uh, finally, the you know okay, so all I've done is I've executed a query. I'm evaluating whether it's an error. The very next thing is uh, once it's not an error, this block gets called. And what we're essentially doing here is transforming. Collection of results. Uh, in this case, it's just going to be a single user record. And what we're doing is all of this is basically creating us a user, uh, user object, and we're wrapping that as an option, and then finally calling OK or else at the bottom. And OK or else will, will either turn the user option of a user into a result of a user, or it's going to enter into that final code block and, again, produce some, uh, some more additional useful uh, error blocking and another custom error type, because essentially there are two types of errors that happen in the majority of your uh, What I've experienced so far when I'm, when I'm working with Postgres, there are two types of errors that, may, that will generally occur. 
occur, you're not getting back to the result at all, uh, or there's a specific type of error that was raised in that source code. So if you go through this whole block, you see it uh, within those two other handling spaces, um, I'm covering both scenarios. So this is how you do it. And this is essentially uh, how you, you know, draw an out. So um, it's, it's actually not that complicated. We've gone through a few examples. I had to copy and paste. So I had to do this before I was um, into a lot of my other work. So either it's all wrong or at least it's consistent with wrong. Uh, but uh, no, it, there's a general pattern, and I've tried to explain this before, as you're trying to add user you're, you're transforming uh, input parameters to SQL types, running your SQL statement, handling errors, logging activity. And then finally, transforming the query results into rust types. And if you go through the code base, you're going to see this all throughout models.rs. So, a little bit about integration tests. Uh, I'm not going to actually show you what I'm testing, but you feel free to go over the test directory and see for yourself how I've done it. Um, I have experienced some painful lessons along the way that I'd like to share with you. Maybe it will help you uh, avoid them. So one thing is, if your application is using connection pooling, don't just by having bring in that connection pool start using your test. Instead, don't use the connection pool at all. Create your connections independently for each test, and even better, just use transactions and allow the transaction to roll back. Um, when you're using Lost Postgres connections, it will commit by default. Uh, you have to configure it not to commit um, if you're running tests. Transaction will roll back by default and it's far easier to launch it. Uh, another thing is Rust is very fast. If it runs this test in parallel by default, um, I've actually gone into trouble because I, I mean, I've run into like uh, certain files in the database and problems with connections. I think I've had deadlock issues too. Um, that were somehow related to all these tests running in parallel and hitting tables at the same time so quickly. So, um, running in parallel, it seems great, except when you're working with uh, your testing database operation. Uh, so, some of the solutions that I found uh, to avoid these problems uh, include using just unique fake data for each test. There's good libraries for generating fake data. Um, Seeding the database with test data I don't want to share a certain data set across tests. Uh, and also, you can throttle uh, the number of threads that are being used in cardboard tests at the very bottom. Uh, in the bottom right, uh, there's an additional flag you can use where you're saying uh, test threads equal one. What we're doing here is we're really just slowing down the test, but it's not going to fail. Uh, we're running all the tests sequentially. You're not going to but, um, you know, essentially, these are some of the tricks, some of the things that I've, I've learned uh, along the way that so far helped me uh, and can uh, So, essentially, you know, in conclusion, um, I try to figure out, I try to ask myself this question what is unique about us? You know, what can us do for database development Postgres that maybe other languages can't do as easily? What comes natural to us, maybe, um, and are, are some things that you might want to consider. And one is one relates to concurrency. Um, it's very easy to run operations in parallel uh, and or asynchronously in Rust. If you do it using standard library, you could also use frameworks that are available. Uh, I have an example I published on GitHub using Acton Split. I figured out of help, how to run or take one query to split it into five separate independent queries and get back results in you know, one or two parallel. So um, you should consider taking advantage of, of, of uh, concurrency like this in, uh, in Rust. And another thing, you know, I come from a Python background where it's often much faster to run uh, an operation in Postgres than in Python. But now with running Rust, uh, using Rust, um, I could probably take some of the load off of uh, Postgres and put it onto Rust instead. So this pertains maybe to aggregations, maybe JSON aggregations, and things like that. 
haven't explored what the performance differences are, but um, there are people who have reported uh, that an optimal optimized loss code is running faster than C code. So post faster than C, it's very efficient, but it's you know if it's really getting bogged down, hey, maybe uh, it's time to uh, consider offloading some of that uh, some of some of that work on some loss. Uh, and finally, I think that you know in hindsight, after nine months working with Ross, I think that it was worth the effort. Um, I can do something now just as easily in Ross as I can. And um, that's been very harrowing for me. And uh, so I, I still use Python, but it's just, it's just not my, my programming. In fact, I can think of uh, just using Python all over us. Uh, so far, it's been a good route, so I, I, I recommend that. I think it's worth it. Well, that's it. And there's um, a link to the repo if anybody wants it. Are there any questions? Not to use diesel. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, what were the actual use cases that you found that Rust Postgres was a lot easier to use than say something like diesel? Um, like exactly what were the things um, that like an example of one thing? Yeah. So okay, so there were just some there's just some functionality that's not even there yet. And I don't even know if the authors want it there. Um, because I think they're right, I'm not going to quote them, but I suspect that uh, they believe that uh, the order and query builder should be for basics, and you can see it's the law SQL with parameter binding for non basics. So I, I really do think that you can have a hybrid, they, 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 they support the hybrid concept. Um, one such uh, feature that I had once uh, that I needed, that I had used prior, uh, related to using higher level data. Um, so, uh, like, Table where the foreign key is self joining or joins back to the same table, and with that hierarchy, uh, something like that was available, at least when I, when I needed it. Uh, another, another feature that I had wanted was support for common table expressions, CTEs. Uh, I use CTEs all over the place, uh, it, it's all been very convenient. CTEs weren't there yet. And I use all different kinds of CTEs, uh, so that wasn't there. Um, I can't think of other things, but there is a functional. So, um, again, if I was going to use well, see, with primary binding, mostly, you know, why am I, why am I going to bother using this huge library? So. Yes? Uh, on page three of the code, like, how did you convince uh, Rust that the result of that query was going to be a row? Uh, or, like, what did row.get was not an I64? Like, how would that fail or not? Yeah. So how would I convince Russ that it's a row? Yeah, like why is row dot get an I sixty four? Um and like row dot get two is a string. Okay, and like how did you convince uh, yeah. Russ that? Okay, so I'm glad you brought this up. So there are basically two conventions <clears throat> that are supported with the get method. You can reference by index, you can reference by string. And it's just going in grabbing elements out of the collection. Element zero is this, element one is this. Um, and Rust knows, or, or had I convinced Rust, yeah. using from SQL, the from SQL implementations oh, for those types behind the scenes are what drive that. Okay. Um, so, like, if you change the query on one of the previous pages, uh, to, like reorder the columns, it would still compile and then just like fail at runtime? Is that what's. If you reorder these, then the placements, you see dollar signs, the dollar sign yeah, yeah. values, that corresponds to the placement here. Yeah. So first name, last name, and user name. Sorry, I mean reordering, One, two, reordering the returning. So it won't panic. It'll, it'll panic at that time? Okay. Yeah. So if you like ask for a number and it's not a number at all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. If you're referencing by index, it'll blow up. If you reference by name, it'll blow up. Um, so either of those can happen. Okay. Uh, reference by name is not as fast as referencing by index. Yeah. Programmers, there's some programmers that will go here referencing by index. They say it's too brittle, it's going to break. Uh, you should just take the small 
several nanosecond hits and just reference using the name logo. Um, and you don't even have to, there's a, there's a crate that allows you, that automatically does the work that I've done here on manual, where you're we're referencing row and we're creating a user. Yeah. Um, there's a crate that allows you to resolve everything in one command line. Um, it's just saying, take the entire result, create me a user, you can do that. I didn't provide it here because there's a crate for it, it's on GitHub. Okay. And I asked the author only today why I said this is great. There wasn't an answer, there wasn't in a production setting yet, but it has been recently, so that's going to be very cool. Uh, my question is less to do with like the SQL than it does the logging. Uh, are you, yeah. you what what logging? Uh, uh, so I, across all the so there's a variety of logging options right now. Russ, um, after talking with people and evaluating my options, um, I went with a, a library called Slog mm -hmm. as a for structured logging, and uh, I log. Uh, I can create a, a huge amount of uh, meaningful context in a log. Uh, step by step, adding something to it as it's going through, um, and so this is this is the syntax we're using. It's like you have to pass it around, mm -hmm. along, you know, the context of the law. Cool. Why are you calling next there? Uh, so I know I'm only getting one result. Uh -huh. uh, so instead of referencing by an index value in the collection. I'm just saying, get me the next result. So this is a safe way. This is an alternative to referencing by index. So okay. Call next on an iterator. And that's going to give you. Uh, oh, so the map. Option. The map is not mapping over an iterator. It's mapping over an option. Yeah, uh, over an option. Okay. Okay. Uh, tricky. And it works because I know the only one I'll be there. If I was working with a collection, I'm going to say next. There you go. In the back, yes. Uh, for your business? Yeah, I'm using it entirely. I mean, I'm, I'm, full, I'm all in on Rust. Yeah. Well, what's been your experience in implementing technology in Rust? Like, do you feel more productive, less productive? Or like so I'm at the point, yeah, I'm at the point now. Everything has been through, and I'm working on all new development. Um, I'm just as productive now in Rust as I have been on the Python. But, you know, there are things you just can't do. Um, uh, I turned back to Python. So I'm, I'm now kind of discovering like how to 